We're at the homestead of a fellow named Jordan, and we're at a really interesting, unique, off-grid homestead, unlike anything I've ever seen before. This is totally off-grid. So we've got off-grid electrical, we've got heat, we've got water capture, we've got food growing, we've got livestock, and we've got a very interesting tiny house that's not a tiny house. It's a tiny house that is two pieces put together, high ceilings, lots of space, three bedrooms, very, very unique. The coolest thing about this entire setup is that Jordan has made it modular. So we're on a land lease here. He's leasing this land. He's leasing about three acres on a larger parcel uh, that there was a commercial farming operation here, organic farm. And he's found a really lean and inexpensive way to live on the land off grid and kind of move the needle forward on developing a homestead with the intention that he might eventually move. So we're gonna get a full tour of this place. We're gonna to talk to Jordan about the specifics of the systems he has here. We're gonna look in detail at the hydronic system, the, the plumbing. We're gonna look at the electrical off-grid system. We've got seven kilowatts of solar. We've got uh, gas uh, generator backup. We've even got a, a small micro hydro system here. And the house is just fantastic. It, he, he's built it himself, designed it himself, Super, super unique. The coolest thing about this, the, my biggest takeaway from, from touring this property is that here's an example of somebody who wanted to do the four things that I've talked about for a very long time, the, the food, water, energy, shelter, nexus. How do you get those things and work towards being as self-sufficient as you can in them without having the land? So he's a tenant here on the land, but he can pick this whole thing up and move it to a new location if he so chooses. So this is a very, very interesting homestead. I've been blown away with, with the things that I've seen and I've actually learned a lot and I hope you guys too. Let's get into it. This is an original. I sometimes wanna go back, back to the time when it was nine and had no worries. Not a care in the world. I sometimes wanna believe. Hi, my name is Jordan and this is my story can be free, free to be, free to please. So hit me with another track. So we're, we're in the lower mainland, uh, Vancouver, Canada, um, just on the outskirts. Uh, my friend likes to say that we are just uh, west of civilization, but just east of nowhere. And so it's a bit of a mixture of rural residential and, and farm acreages out here. I grew up in Calgary, um, city slicker, born and raised, and but fond memories of exploring in the forest as a kid and um, yeah just have always been drawn to I've always wanted to get out more into nature and 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 live in nature um, uh, yeah went I took a um, civil engineering technology program at SAIT in Calgary so I have a diploma in that and I've made a living in project management scheduling planning uh, resource projects so large resource projects and yeah I've been able to pay the bills through that and um, I also kind of dabble in, in, in playing and writing music and so part of the intent here was to get my expenses down to little to nothing to afford me to hang, hang out with my kids more often to do music stuff to live you know hang out with the animals around here so that's a little bit about you know the intent and the backstory there. I uh, bought an acreage in this area um, back in 2016. I uh, went through a separation divorce and we sold and uh, was able to do well on that. I put a lot of sweat, sweat equity into that house and the house previous and extensive renovations. And so I had the decision to make whether to purchase another property and get myself into another long-term mortgage or take that capital and uh, take land out of the equation build something that I wanted and that it was mobile um, and off-grid and so that's what I chose to do instead of getting roped into another uh, long-term mortgage with the bank. So I, I decided early on in my design process that I wanted to be off-grid, not out of necessity. I could have run a cable over to the, uh, the house on the grid on the property. Uh, it would have been a long cable, probably like 
500 feet. Um, but I chose to be off grid and then I also chose redundant energy systems. And so uh, when it comes to electricity, I've got, uh, I'm running, be able to run on either solar, uh, PV is the primary source. And then I've recently just hooked up a little micro uh, hydro turbine in the rainwater runoff ditch going to the creek behind the house. And then the third option that I'm looking at installing right now is a TEG. So it's a thermal electric generator that draws electricity off of heat, off of heat differential on my wood stove. So those are the three sources. And then of course, generator backup when all those three sources don't work, which often is happening more often than I'd like. So it's about dialing that in and figuring out what works, what do we need to conserve? Um, so that's, that's the dance and the balance that I've been uh, looking at for the last year since I've been in here. So able to heat three ways. So I'm, I'm heating water through either propane gas in my commie boiler. I'm able to heat my domestic hot water with my excess solar electricity in a uh, domestic hot water tank with a, just a normal 3000 watt element. And so my inverter solar charge controller all in one unit, uh, SolarC, has the ability to uh, divert electricity into a secondary load when you based on the setting. So when the batteries are full, now I'm dumping 3000 watts into a hot water tank. And then the third way is with wood. So I, I ran a little a loop, three quarter inch stainless steel serpentine loop through the wood stove. And that brings heat back to the shipping container where my utilities are through heat exchangers into the hydronic floors in the house or into my hot water tank. So primarily heating the house with hydronic floors, radiant floors. So it's propane costs. Um, I'm, I'm using more propane than I thought I would, but you know, I can dial that back obviously with stock in the wood stove more often. Um, so it's propane costs. I have a Starlink satellite. So those are like my two monthly utility bills right there. Um, I'm collecting rainwater. That's our, our potable water source. Um, and then I have a, a low lease payment uh, for the land. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's afforded me the flexibility to, I'm not reliant on having to, you know, enter the rat race. I can kind of pick and choose opportunities. And so that was a big motivation behind this too. So I, I designed it in, in SketchUp. Um, I learned just enough how to use the program to cobble together what I wanted and it really helped me identify and shape and how I wanted to use the space. So really, that was a really uh, beneficial tool. Shout out to uh, Tiny Nest. Um, I, I ordered their course and walked through it. He does a good job of explaining how to use the program. Um, and I knew I wanted it to be mobile. Um, so I watched a ton of tiny, uh, tiny home videos on YouTube and uh, what I've often found in that space is, especially with families, they'll build this tiny home <clears throat> and they'll move in with a couple kids and then they're, prob they're selling it within a year because it's just, you're on top, especially in the Canadian winters, you're on top of each other. And so, uh, um, so my philosophy was, okay, well, why don't I build two, connect them? So that's what I've done here is it's, a, it's an L shape. Um, so there's kind of like two wings and there's three bedrooms. So the kids, I have two kids, they each have their own loft bedroom and then in the other wing I have my own uh, loft bedroom a master bedroom and uh, so yeah that was one of the uh, design principles and then I knew that I wanted to go extra wide a lot of tiny homes you know they stick to the eight and a half feet wide um, because of you want to be able to relocate it and I figure I won't be I hope, hopefully won't be moving this very often maybe once or twice um, or, or maybe not ever uh, but so, so I decided to go extra wide, extra height, and just to afford that flexibility. Another one of my design principles was to uh, create a really tight, efficient space. You know, if I'm using um, off-grid energy sources, then I want to obviously use as, as less of, of those as possible. So um, efficient wall cavity system with high density spray foam, um, exterior insulation, um, but then also adding a whole bunch of windows to bring the light in and to really bring the outside in. Um, and yeah, fortunate enough to live backed onto a forest. So it's kind of cool. You feel part of, part of the outside here. And then 
a nice expanse out of the pasture. I can see the, the sheep out there. So I chose to do, um, I, I, I love the look of the cedar sh shingle. And what I chose is it kind of looks like a shake, but it is a sh shingle. And, but it, putting those on with exterior insulation meant strapping. Um, so I did horizontal battens. And, but those battens have to be right at the exact spot for that shingle to staple through and getting those battens in place. And the, so I did it all predominantly myself. Uh, I had help with a, a good buddy, Red. He came down for a weekend from Calgary, so thanks, Red. Uh, but it, man, that took way longer than I thought it would. It was painstaking, but it turned out great. And I loved the look of it and, and the performance and, and shingles do get a, actually a decent R value on their own. Um, and so it, it's going to function really well. Um, so, and then the back side, I chose to go with a, a seven eight uh, black flat black steel corrugated siding. <clears throat> um, so that provides a little bit of added insurance in terms of fire protection on the back side. I'm right up against this forest here, and uh, just like the look of the flat black. And um, but again, with the extra ins insulation behind that flat black corrugated metal. I went uh, vertical battens or, or strapping and uh, yeah, just extra work. So I chose to go with out, outside the Audi windows. So I had window box around all the windows. So there's a lot of, there's a ton of extra work when you want to do exterior insulation. And uh, so I think I underestimated all that too. So if I were to do this again, uh, um, I would definitely look at going from a two by four to a two by six, get some extra insulation in there. Now you're, you know, the idea with the, with the exter external insulation is it's like a jacket around your house and you don't have that thermal bridging through the studs. Um, but there's like, there's a trade off. And like I said, there's all these windows in here anyways. And so yeah, maybe I would have explored those, run some calcs a little more to determine is the external insulation, the, the like the, the right choice or, uh, but you know, I'm happy with how it's performing so far. And, uh, but yeah, maybe I would have looked at that a little, a little closer. Yeah, one of the things that helped the price was I did majority of the work myself. It's, it's actually always been a, a goal and a dream of mine to design a house and build a house. So that was really cool. I got to tick off that on my bucket list. And so, and I, I was afforded the opportunity to be able to do most of it myself. I had a little bit of construction knowledge over the years. So I solo framed it and did a lot of, most of the carpentry myself. Um, but I hired out stuff where I know I'm not good at and slow at. So drywall and mudding. I had a good mechanical contractor who helped me with all my copper and, and lines, a uh, good electrical contractor, you know, ticketed trades guys that know their thing. Um, I want to make sure that stuff is done all properly. Uh, what else did I have? I, I did the, the metal roofing on my own. That was quite the chore, uh, especially the flashing on seven skylights. Holy, but, uh, I did, yeah, the majority of the work uh, on my, by myself. And it was, it was a slog. It was, it's a marathon. Let me tell you. <laughs> The timeline, I, I started the build in uh, September of 2020 and we moved in at the, uh, well, I guess New Year's Eve of uh, 2021, 2022. So I've been in here for just about a year and, uh, but we moved in, there was a lot of stuff that we still needed to get finished. And uh, we're, we're pretty much there where I think we're probably 97% there. There's a, there's a few spots where some finish that, that's, that's, that's the stuff that takes forever. All the finishing carpentry, it's like, it's never ending, yeah. but, uh, no, yeah, that, that's, that's roughly the timeline. So I got two kids, uh, uh Jack and Ella, uh, 10 and 13 teenager and soon to be teenager. And, uh, uh, so I designed it with obviously their input. So they had, they had input into the design process and helped in the build. And I designed it so that, you know, they've got their kind of space on one wing. And I put a sliding door in, like a glass sliding door that I just picked up off of Marketplace and uh, which needs some love right now. It's looking kind of shady, but it, it provides that isolation, sound isolation, if you want that. Um, so the kids can kind of do their thing and make noise. And alternatively too, um, I, I dabble in music recording, so it kind of can serve that function too. You can have two different spaces for, for recording music. So that's the benefit of having like basically two wings. Or it's basically two lar extra large tiny homes put together in an L shape. So I bought a Nectar Baker's Oven 350. Uh, it's a New Zealand made little 
beast of an oven and pumps out the heat and so it'll cook it'll bake in the bottom it'll we can you know cook on top of it and then i've added a a, a loop a glycol three quarter inch stainless steel loop through there back to my shipping container to draw heat into my domestic hot water and floor and then another combo or another modification i'm making to this stove is i'm i'm adding a tag a thermoelectric generator onto the side of this so this little pizza oven is doing quite a few different things and it also looks great I put a lot of thought into how high I could go with this and still relocate it. Um, so if it's sitting on a two foot trailer deck height, um, there's, I can pretty much get it anywhere in BC. BC Highways has a, there's a, there's a tool, there's an online clearance tool that BC has that uh, will show you which lane and which bridge, you know, you can't get under sort of thing at, at a certain height. I made a list of of must-haves for the potential new location if, if I were to relocate this and I have to maybe consult that but one of them is um, I'd, li I'd like some space um, I love being you know having being backed onto this forest here is great um, space for a pasture for animals would be ideal and then maybe near a body of water but then also being in a community of folks who are also on the self-reliant aspect that's, that's important to me and learn, learning what, what are some of these shared values that, that are, are beneficial or that we're aligned on because that's important, right, at the, mm -hmm. at the end of the day. If I was to relocate this, um, so I, des I designed it, I, had, I looked at potentially building it on a trailer. That's what a lot of tiny homes do, just build right on a trailer. But because I was 10 feet wide, um, I was looking at having a 10 foot wide trailer fabricated and it's expensive, obviously. And so I was talked out of, I, I hired a design consultant early on who'd built a lot of honey homes and he recommended keep the trailer separate from the house. And now you have a trailer that you can use, you know, you can have, you have use with that, right? So, um, so the idea is I would uh, cut the surfaces between the two wings. I would take apart a bit of the roof and then there's some plates holding it together. And then I would jack up uh, the one unit and drive a trailer underneath it. There's some crushed compact gravel underneath here to support that. And then sit that on the trailer bed and roll away with some pilot cars and then do that again and then relocate the shipping container. And then I got to take apart solar panels. And so there'd be a few moves and it. It's, it's not a one day scenario, but, uh, but I designed and built everything to, to be able to be relocatable. So the house is, uh, footprint wise, it's 720 square feet. And then if you include the three sleeping lofts, which are about four foot height uh, over the beds, that's an additional 300. So it's roughly 1,050 square feet if you include those sleeping lofts. Um, and I designed it fairly open on the one wing, uh, so, um, lots of bright, you know, open windows and flowing into the kitchen. So kind of a great room kitchen area. Uh, master bedroom above the kitchen, um, a decent sized kitchen for for the cooking that I would like to do and hope to do and sometimes do. And then the a nice little office nook where it can function as music recording or work from home station um, underneath one of the children's lofts and then flowing into another kind of living room area where there's that's where the the fireplace is, uh, the wood stove, um, and also so a living space in there. Um, and then, you know, the kit, and then the, the third bedroom loft, the kids loft over the, the bathroom. So the bathroom design evolved. Um, originally, I was gonna have the washer dryer in the front hall closet. And then there was a utility room in the house. And I decided to make my utility room in a shipping container for a couple of reasons. One was I'm doing rainwater collection here. I've got eight separate thousand liter uh, IBC totes. And so in terms of kind of a climate controlled scenario that's sitting in the, sh in the shipping container. And that just gave me more flexibility and space for the hydronic heating, copper components, the water, the the solar and I'm, I'm kind of glad all these utilities are not in the house uh, so they can make noise and do their thing and and whatnot and gas and and then it's I'm not I'm not worried about that being inside the house so 
Um, so that's what's so that afforded me the, the space now to have a little washroom, closet, toilet room with the stacker washer dryer. So it actually worked out better in the end that way too. So the, the very first um, piece of material I bought for the house was a, um, a used stained glass circle window that uh, I just found at the local new news shop here. And um, it came out of a house years ago. And uh, yeah, I just love the design. Uh, so yeah, um, that's, that's turned out good. I had a, um, another circle window actually made uh, by a fe fellow called uh, Zil Vardos down. So he made the frame. He, li he's, he built tiny homes down in Olympia, Washington. And he built uh, the other circle window that's on the other wing. And then he put the frame together for the stained glass circle piece. Um, so yeah, that, was, that worked out good. I'm happy with how that turned out. And then um, my buddy, Stephen Ebison, who lives on the island, um, he did a fantastic job at that uh, kind of hobbit arch door. Um, he tied, it, tied in the design of the stained glass window into the door and just did a fantastic job, the solid oak door. Um, I love it. So he nailed that out of the park. And, uh, and then a whole bunch of windows that I purchased from Legacy Windows, who I think believe use vinyl tech. And um, yeah, uh, really good to work with them. They, they came and installed them within two days and some really big windows here, including this massive sliding door that's uh, 12 feet wide by eight feet high which is um, a decent size uh, sliding door for a not so tiny home. Some of the challenges were like, I'm not an experienced builder. So and a lot of these, you know, building processes aren't hard per se on their own. Um, but, but then you're always second guessing, am I following the right procedure? Is this gonna be waterproof? Is this the right way to do it? Um, so there's a lot of that going on. Um, almost every week, there seems like it's a challenge that's unsurmountable, but then you figure it out and so uh, yeah, building it solo and a lot of doing this stuff the first time, it just takes effort and determination and, uh, and a lot of YouTube video watching. And then, um, you know, and then just juggling the demands of shared custody as a solo dad during construction. So that was one of the challenges. And then just learning how to live with off-grid energy systems. So having to think about, you know, what, you know, can I, can we run can we run these tools? Can we, um, yeah, always, it's a learning process of uh, figuring out what works. What, when you're on primarily rainwater catchment and it doesn't rain for four months, okay, you gotta have backup systems. And uh, so what we're doing is I'm able to drive down the road to a municipal well, fill up an IBC tote and bring it back and top up the tanks if I need. I, I, I had to do that twice last summer, which a lot of folks around here actually have to do anyways with a shallow well. So that's one of the challenges is just learning and adapting to living off grid, not on the grid. The whole bylaws permits issue, uh, <clears throat> currently like in Canada and, and in most places, most jurisdictions, the tiny house design philosophy doesn't really fit into most local bylaw codes. And so that's, that's one of the number one challenges to doing this is like, how do I, how do I find a piece of property and, and park this on it? Um, so, but that just takes determination and networking and, um, and, and I'm fairly confident if you wanted to go down that road, um, the permitting road, there, there's options, there's flexibility, there's CSA permits. Um, and I think that over time you'll see some municipalities start to adopt um, the, the tiny home design principles into their codes. All right, Jordan. So talk a little bit about, um, talk about the land right now, where we are, what's going on here. Sure, yeah. I'm leasing an acre on a roughly 21 acre parcel. I chose this section of the land. Uh, it's the sunniest spot on this property and then just tucked into the trees. Um, so it's right on the, the ravine and um, with a creek down below. And then there's a, it's a beautiful pasture here that, uh, you know, I've mowed down the blackberries as you can see on the lawn here, but a recent addition is uh, a little flock of sheep that I just purchased this year. 
and the plan is to rotationally graze them in the two acres just adjacent to me. Um, the flock is a, uh, a, a Suffolk Katahdin cross and uh, so far so good. Um, um, it's, it's early days, I'm a beginner shepherd and uh, they're, they're, they're quite easy to, to work with so far and, uh, and enjoyable to have around. There's six um, ewes here and there's four generations, so they're all related. I shopped around a little bit. I wanted a, a, a healthy young flock um, and these were so healthy that they were checked for worms and the previous owners didn't have any worms, so they weren't even deworming them. Um, and it's, so that's my goal is to keep them fed with pasture and you know keep where they're staying clean and so they're not sleeping in poop and and uh, so these 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 this is kind of like the breeding stock so I would I'd like to bring in a ram and the thing I don't have here is a like a barn I do have a 20 by 40 structure that I'd like to put up at some point um, so for right now they're just uh, sleeping in that little shelter at night but the plan is to bring in a ram um, in the next month or two and then they would lamb it's a five month gestation period so then they would lamb um, uh, you know in, in May or June out in the field and that's that's the kind of the season you want around here if they're just going to lamb in the pasture and, and not in, indoors so and then and just work with that stock from there and then um, you know either either find market for the lambs when they're grown at, at five to eight months whatever it works out being um, or continue those lambs as, as part of the breeding stock. So, Do you yeah. want to eat them or just kind of sell off the lambs? Yeah, I, I, consider my, like I, I consider meat to be one of the healthiest food sources we have. I think it's been uh, ostracized and there's been a lot of stigma on meat in terms of you know, supposed carbon input. But I think if it's done properly in a regenerative way where they're eating the pasture they're putting actually carbon back into the soil. Um, you're not putting inputs into it. It's, it's the natural way. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had uh, bovine and, and, you know, for millennia on this, you know, or, you know, thousands and thousands of years in North America. And I think it's, it's, it's the natural way to convert grassland into protein. And uh, so I think if they're raised humanely and in a, in a good setting and, and, you know, cared for, then I think that's a win-win for everyone. You got some birds running around. Talk a little about them. <laughs> uh, the adjacent property here um, started with a big flock of birds, some heritage birds, and um, uh, I took uh, a dozen eggs from them and incubated them. Just bought an incubator off of Amazon. 21 days later, they hatch, and out of 12 eggs, uh, 10 hatched, which is a pretty good rate. And um, we're down to six now on that first batch. Uh, there's there's predators around here. We so my little my dog Murph there in the background. That guy's a little champ. He is a part Aussie Shepherd, part Bernese, and he's learned off of the two dogs on the property that are livestock guarding dogs. They're they're Great Pyrenees, and so those dogs are just naturally they hear something in the bushes. They're right after it, but they're gentle. They're gentle with people. So he's picked up those tendencies, and he's great. He sleeps under the house. He's, he's outside all the time and he's, he keeps care of these chickens. Like that's why, so we were gone for a few weeks this summer doing some traveling. We had someone staying here and we came back and unfortunately there, I think it was four birds that we had lost, even though I think the dog that, 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 that the house sitter had was actually inside the house. So that doesn't work very well. So he, he's great. He keeps these chickens safe. And then also with the sheep. So um, having, you know, it's when you have livestock and chickens and it's either you put up a, a massive big fence like you've done at your property and, uh, and, and you go that route or you have livestock guardian dogs. And so, so far we've been lucky with Murphy's. And so he's, um, yeah, these chickens are good. They're, they're, they're definitely, they've got, they're free range chickens. They've got free range of the whole property. And um, uh, I'd, I'd like to eventually have them a proper run that includes portion into that forest. So they have some shade in the summer. Uh, the struggle was keeping them in their run. They were just flying out of the run. And uh, so it's, I'm thinking of just having to build a, a taller fence. I don't really want to have to clip their wings. Mm -hmm. So that's the next step. And then the other major challenge is we're not getting any eggs there. I've moved them around a few times, 
they go into their house every night, it's, it's an automatic door, and they got nesting boxes that I've seen them in, and they have laid in there a couple times, but I think they've gotten used to laying in a certain spot in the bushes, and we're actually having a hard time finding where the hell are they laying these eggs. They are laying. Now, they're, they're, it's way reduced right now because of the season. So yeah, that's, that's something we wanna dial in, you know, going forward is, you know, that, that's their primary purpose is to provide us with some eggs, and that's unfortunately not happening right now. Yeah. My solar array is 18 400 watt panels, so it's 7.2 kilowatts. Um, I chose just a ground mount simple. Um, I looked into some systems where we can change the tilt. There's facing due south, and I chose a, a bit of a tilt towards the winter season. Um, cheated just a little bit. And I looked at you know the cost of having it uh, tilt versus panels are actually the cheapest component of a solar system. And so the, the thought being, we'll just add two or three more panels to get that same efficiency of tilting it. So that's, that's the, what I've chosen right now. And um, so far so good. It's just a simple, I've driven these posts into the ground and uh, yeah, it hasn't shifted over. These, this is actually one of the first things I put up. This powered the build, powered all the saws. And uh, um, so yeah, this has been working like a champ. It, you know, you can get in a cloudy situation, you can get to like 10%, maybe more, but around here, when it socks in, you're not getting a lot. You're getting probably 5% less than that. So, um, but all in all, really happy with this investment. This should, these should just keep performing. So right now, this is probably pulling a hundred watts or something, right? Yeah, we can go check it out. Yeah, yeah. You know, what's coming off the micro hydro right now? Unfortunately, right now I'm in the shoulder season where my micro hydro is, is basically rainwater runoff from this kind of hill mountain behind us. So it runs when it's raining and about a few days after, but if it's not raining or we've come out of a dry period here, so unfortunately I'm not getting anything out of my hydro today. Um, but if it continues, you know, it's kind of snowing right now, but if it turns into rain, I'll, st I'll be able to draw on the low side, hundred Watts and at the, the peak is only 200 Watts. But when you look at that over the course of a day, that's, you know, close to five kilowatt hours and that that's a decent chunk of energy. So, um, uh, it's barely, you're really uh, constrained in terms of when it's micro hydrous, how much flow and what's your head height. So I'm limited in both those regards here, unfortunately. So I've only got 45 feet of head and really low flow to no flow. So, so I'm at the bare minimum and I'm able to get, you know, 150 watts up to 200 in, in, a, in a higher flow scenario. And uh, so that's, that's working well for me. Obviously the winter time is the least amount of production, but what does it look like on the other six months, the warmer six months from just your solar? Yeah. Gets you everything you need. Oh, this is a breeze. In the summer, like life is good. I can run my AC units inside, no problem. We have ample power for everything. Um, just longer days and around here, just the climate the way it is, it's, you know, it's sunny for, you hardly see a cloud between like July and September. But uh, it's definitely a challenge in the winter in the yeah. Pacific Northwest. And what about the, what, what's the total kilowatt hours of your batteries? So I what have 30 kilowatt hours of storage in my batteries and they're LFP, lithium iron phosphate. And I spent a, a good chunk of change on them. And um, there are cheaper options. The ones I got were kind of top spec, CSA approved, um, but they're warrantied for 10,000 cycles. If you do the math at 80% depth of discharge. So that's like 20 years plus. And uh, so I, I sunk a bit of money into these batteries. Um, yeah, I, but it's never like, it's not enough. 30 kilowatt hours, I, you know, you're always, you're always wanting more. It, it, so it's a balance between, okay, what can we do without Maybe we turn the propane boiler off. We just use the wood stove and we can function with a little bit of micro hydro. So it's a trade off, you know, yeah. that, you, that it's a dance that you walk around. Yeah. Okay, so Jordan, we're here at the, the kind of the hub of the, the off grid system. So mm -hmm. in here we've got water capture, we've got the electrical hub with batteries, inverters, mm -hmm. charge controllers, batteries. Mm -hmm. And then we've got gas boiler. Mm -hmm. What else is in here? 
and then heat is. exchangers to take the heat from the wood stove and put it back into the floor or domestic hot water. So just circle back a little bit to why you decided to do it all this way and not not closer to the house or you know what what, what was it about this in particular? Sure, yeah. Uh, so this is serving primarily as the, the, the water system and capture. And I looked at what it would, you know, uh, what a lot of folks do when they're doing rainwater harvesting is, is a black poly tank outside. Um, and, but in this climate, you gotta, you, go, you gotta always worry about it freezing up and sure you can run heat trace on the lines, but then that's drawing power. And so I decided, okay, well, why not just insulate a shipping container? Um, uh, the nice thing about a shipping container is if there ever there's a fire around here, it's, it's, everything's contained in there. Um, and it's, so it's basically it's a climate controlled uh, water storage that also is, serves as my utility room. Is there a heat source in there? It's just residual heat from the propane boiler and the piping in there. And because it's insulated and all that, it's that's insulated good and there's to keep those... that, that all that mass of water is like a battery right, storage. Right. So it, yeah, I'm, I'm not really worried about this thing freezing. Yeah, because those batteries they've got to stay above zero. Right? Yep. And, yes. And so have, have you monitor the temperature in here, and it's. I'm not monitoring it now, but it's staying above zero. It I know is, that. Yeah. 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 Cool. Let's check it out. Yeah. Wow, you've got a lot of water storage in here. So yeah, so I did. Wow. Uh, you got some squash storage in here. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of serving as our root cellar in a bit and Murph's gonna come dry off too. So I, I looked at, so we've got 8,000 liter IBC totes and I sketched out what it would take to do like just a, a cistern in here. You know, I looked at, do I want my water, my potable water in plastic? And I, so I played around with that. What does it look like to have like, um, you know, an aluminum tank? And it was gonna be pretty pricey to do that. And I, I originally didn't want to do the totes because there's just so many connections, more places to fail. But once you get that all dialed in, the nice thing about totes and shipping containers, they just fit in here so nicely. They're perfect, like too, too wide, too high. It's just a really efficient uh, space of use, uh, or sorry, use of space. And um, so that's the water system. It's being filtered by what's called a maelstrom. So there, it's a 180 micron filter bag and a couple other filters. It's also going through gutter guard. So it's coming into the tanks fairly clean. It's been filtered a few times, um, but there still is some residual in there. And then, so I'm using a 50 micron filter and then two five micron carbon filters and then an ultraviolet system. So, and then an additional filter in the fridge. So it's like, if you count them all up, it's about nine times I'm filtering it and I'm pretty safe that, um, or, or pretty certain that it, it, the rainwater is safe. So this is uh, the hub of the electricity power system. Um, I, so I chose to go with this Solark. So it's an all-in-one inverter, charge controller, MPPT, plug and play. So everything's sitting in this unit. So it makes it a little bit simpler for installing it. There's a nice smart load feature on this. So I can program it so that my batteries are 100% charged. There's a secondary load that turns on and I'm heating hot water with the excess solar. So that's a nice feature with through here. Um, I like this, the display program. I can easily see, you know, it's cloudy and snowing. I'm getting 150 watts right now, which isn't great, but uh, we're getting something. And then the house is drawing 270 watts right now and going into the batteries is 170. What I didn't realize with this unit is that it actually, it consumes 60 watts continuous just to run. There's a lot of electronics happening in here. And um, I, you know, that's more than, than other systems. So this is the one drawback to the Solark, but uh, you know, it's, they, they've got a good marketing team and they, they sold me and military tested and able to withstand EMP you know, shocks. And so far it's, it's performed good. I guess that's the one drawback I would say is that it's consuming 60 watts continuous. <clears throat> so this, this is the micro hydro turbine. Oh, okay. So this tells me what I'm getting down at the creek. And then this is the charge controller related to that system. Okay. And these are the breakers for it. And then, so that, that system is independent from the solar and it's going straight into my batteries. 
So that's 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 what that's doing, the microhydro. And it's, then the, it's all stays DC going right into the it batteries. It stays DC, and then the we're. DC side. I'm working on adding in now that the thermal electric generator on the wood stove. Yeah. That'll be on a similar breaker here, a similar type of display. So, so and it's just right controller. into the batteries. Yeah, separate from the solar. So those those will be the. The, the three electric uh, components of the system. This is what I like to call the wall of copper. Um, shout out to Mike Jr. Mechanical, he is out of Kelowna. So he put this together and I worked with him on some preliminary design and then this is kind of his brainchild though, predominantly. And so this is the heart of it. So this is a, a combi boiler by Renai. So combi meaning that you've got the hydronic loop and pumps taking heat into the floor. And then the other side of that is your domestic hot water and cold loop. And so how we rigged this up is this tank, there's a sensor on the top of it. When it goes below 115, it triggers a call for hot water. And typically these are on demand, but it's, it's, it's calling for uh, water from the bottom of the tank and then just cycling hot water into the, into the tank and bringing it up to whatever we have it dialed in here at 120. But then the other nice feature of this tank, this is a modified electric hot water tank. So there was two 3000 watt elements in here. So we took off the bottom 3000 watt element and that's where it's basically an indirect hot water tank, but we still have this 3000 watt element up here and that's what gets triggered and turned on by the solar when the battery is over 100%. So that's the domestic hot water. And then the other feature of this wall of copper is these heat exchangers. So I'm able to draw heat from the wood stove and pump it into either the floor loop coming down here through this pump or the priority being domestic hot water. So this pump pulls heat over to the domestic hot water heat exchanger and into the hot water tank. So, so redundancy, so three ways to heat the hot water, electric, propane and wood. Yeah, a lot of a lot of controls here, like a lot of um, aquastats. So when the wood, there's an aquastat behind the, the the wood stove in the house. When it senses heat, um, it turns on this pump. So then it starts doing a loop. And then this aquastat, when it senses heat, it's turning on either this or this pump, based on what's called for. So you've built in the optionality to put in a wood boiler. That's very smart. Yeah. You've got a lot invested yeah. in just this, that if now you said, well, I, I, I'm not getting <clears throat> enough BTUs for what I'm put, spending on energy, I want yeah. a wood boiler, oh shit, now I gotta revamp the whole thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, like that wood stove in there isn't very big. Like you can put a 12 inch piece of wood in there and then you gotta keep feeding it. And so yeah, ideally, that's what I'd like to upsize is, uh, is an outdoor wood boiler attached to this. But for now it's, it's functioning, but you gotta, you gotta get that little stove rip roaring hot for a little while before it's drawing heat into here. Right, right. Yeah. Having the functionality is nice though, right? I like to have that functionality of, if I have the energy for it, the system works well, but it's just knowing when to use it and how to get more power. And so continue looking at new power sources. So this is drawing way more than you thought it was as far as kilowatt hours. It is, yeah. 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 The other nice thing, just to, sorry, to flip back to the solar quickly, yep. is that you can grid tie it as well. It has that optionality and sell back to the grid. So depending on where I am and, and in the future, there is that option and uh, that'd be a nice flexible option to have. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And you got a little baseboard in here, I guess, just as an emergency if you wanted to get it warm or something. No, actually, what that is is a dump load. It's a dump. It's a dump load. So, yeah, okay. Because that little creek turbine, or sorry, hydro micro turbine, you know, it's always spinning. So it's just, yeah, it's a dump load, mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. You don't, so you're not, it's protection for your battery. It's just a little And it's, it's, so, it's mm -hmm. hardly any, like, it's only 200 watts coming 200 off that. Watts, yeah. So this thing rarely would ever be, even get warm. Yeah. 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 Wow. Fantastic. So I, I got this container and it was a tool shed for a pipe fitting company and it had a whole bunch of crap in it. So I had to rip all that out. Um, I, this table was in it. So this is like a, a workbench that was already, I just left it in here for now. And um, yeah, stripped it all down. And then there was already a little bit of insulation in here. So I just kept this insulation. And then this is actually what's behind 
these, not not spray foam. I spray okay. foamed the doors oh, I see. in that cavity, but it's really just a, I think this is like a one inch or not even. Yeah, one um, inch uh, Ico tin or something, Ico yeah. tin foil or something they call it. And it's it's doing the job. It, it's, it's just, it's, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't seem to, it doesn't get, cold in here again i think it's this massive storage of water for sure. helping regulate that temperature yeah and then there's always residual heat this is usually always on yep in the winter time yep and um so yeah not a lot of insulation here but it is insulated yep. just not not uh spray foamed everywhere what's going on there with all that two inch um is that abs that, that that flexible abs or whatever they call that stuff yeah so talk, that talk about that whole setup there yeah sure um so that's all plumb. So all those tanks raise and lower together. Um, I that white PVC that's acting as a vent, so so you don't get an airlock in the bottom tanks as they fill up. Oh, and so that was a piece that you know just it uh, it just plums in. It screws into the top of that uh, tote tank. So that's an important part of it. I did actually have a failure on one of them. That's it's that bottom that far one. So I have to screw that back on that vent cap. And so that, that tank, you can see is out of commission. The, the ball valve on that back tank is closed. Um, but, uh, and then I wasn't using enough pipe dope when I was screwing these together. And you really got to be liberal with your Teflon tape and your pipe dope. And, um, uh, you know, sorry, I, I didn't use Teflon tape because I wanted it to be potable water. So I used just a pipe dope. Mm -hmm that was, uh, had a potable water certification to it. Yep. And um, I, don't, I wasn't using enough though. And so I, I was having leaks, so I had to take this apart. And putting those barbed fittings, that's a, that's a two inch barbed fitting, that plastic, trying to get that off of there oh, is just a- Impossible. Oh, it's so of, hard. Yeah. Just remember that if you're putting that, that barbed two inch plastic hose on there, good luck getting it off. So this is 8,000 liters of water storage. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And fair, fairly inexpensive. The IBCs you can get for 100 and 200 bucks or something, right? Yeah, these are refurbished. So the tanks were used, or sorry, the the metal, um, whatever that is, aluminum, yep. cages were used, but the tanks are new. So I saved a little bit there. And they're, yeah, they're, they're in the order of around 300 bucks okay. a tote. This, there's a lot here, a lot of planning, and, and, and I know from doing these kinds of systems myself that you often <laughs> overlook certain things and go, oh, I should have done this, should have that. What would you, if you could add or change anything about what you've done here, what, what would that be or what would those things be? Sure, yeah. In terms of power, I'm pretty close to being maxed out on this. This is an 8,000 8, kilowatt inverter, which can bump up to 20 for a short few, a few seconds. It's basically like a 33 amp service, but um, I think I can add six more panels out there and then I'm pretty much topped up here. So um, that would be one thing I would look at. I would, there's a model above this, the 12,000, 12K, um, and which, yeah, just flexibility. So that's one thing. Um, the tag, adding that tag in, and we're, so that's, that's being worked on right now to add some more uh, generation, energy generation into the batteries. Um, and then this system, one of the features right now that's not working super, it's working, but when this tank is calling for hot water from the boiler, it's taking quite a while. <clears throat> and I think it's because we've got this sensor on the top of the tank and there's a bit of a time delay. It's, it's just resting, it's underneath the insulation, but on top of that metal. And there's a bit of a delay bet between when the water's heating up and that and that sensor is going through the metal to heat it up. So it's it's running longer than I'd like to heat up this tank. So we're gonna add in a functionality, a bypass valve. So let's say I wanted to go away for a week. This thing's not just continually trying to heat up. And and so then we we bypass and then it's just I want to have a mode where I can go straight on demand, bypass the tank on demand into my shower. Yeah. So we're working on adding that. Uh, functionality in and I you know the other thing I probably would have done differently is yeah, like I said earlier is explore really go through what what type of you know combi boilers are out there how much power do they draw and really add that up um, Mike was a, you know great HVAC guy knows what he's doing but uh, when it comes to off-grid stuff you've really got to add up every watt right and uh, it's a whole different ball you know 
ball of wax. So, uh, but uh, overall, it's uh, it's doing its job, and it's just a matter of uh, figuring out like uh, energy, battery, and it's uh, it's nice in the summer not have to always look at the battery percentage, but in the wintertime, man, we are always checking that battery level. So this is the intake for the micro hydro turbine. Uh, so we're 45 feet above where the turbine is. And how this works is you want to keep your, th this is a three inch HTPE line. You want to keep that pen stock full of water so that you have pressure down there. And so um, fairly simple design, just, you know, a matter of choosing where to put it. This is coming off of a rainwater runoff ditch, which is kind of my only option. So right now we're not getting a lot of flow as you can see. So really not getting any wattage, but um, yeah, this, this took a little bit of playing around. This is kind of like version three of where we're at. And um, yeah, so this is the top end and then I'll, I'll show you down the bottom end. So the idea here is at the overflow at, or at the intake, you always want some water overflowing over that, which tells you that your pipe is full of water. And so we've got some, uh, a couple of pressure gauges down here. And in this low flow scenario right now with only one nozzle or valve open. We're only running at uh, like two piece size. So it's not really enough to get anything into this low flow scenario, but, um, but ideally I have the flexibility or the intent here is I have the flexibility to either have all four valves and, and nozzles hitting this Pelton wheel in here, spinning it, spinning this, this little alternator. And then we're sending a hundred volts DC up to the batteries, converting that to 48 into the batteries. So this is great when there's flow and it's just running all the time. Pretty simple tech. Um, the one, the, one of the challenges here is I, I'm, I haven't put a little shelter over this. And because there's a night sky here, it's not a lot of foliage, this will freeze and it'll crack your valves. So, um, the next little project here is just a simple little shelter. I keep this bucket over the where the electrical is there, just so water stays out of that. But um, I'm gonna, I, I have a little bit of insulation. And I, I got to build a little house over this to keep keep it from freezing. So you, yeah, but uh, fairly simple, straightforward. Yeah, spins and in, in, into the creek. So Jordan, I'm just kind of curious. When you were looking at doing this, obviously you identified that you had some running water somewhere. What were some of the initial calculations you did to get an idea of what you could do? You were looking, did you do a flow calculation of that water? And then like, kind of take me through that process a bit. Yeah, well actually even before that, I looked at this stream, because this stream runs year round, it just trickles in the summer. But right now, there's some energy there. So I explored what it would take to do a diversion and have a little, just in stream propeller going but what I it, there's not a lot of out there on the market for that no. there's a little bit and then it's expensive and I, I I think I could only get 100 watts out of that just based on the flow of this is not it's not moving hardly at all right now yeah, right yeah, yeah. and then so on when it came to this here I didn't think I had enough head originally and the flow is so low so that's really the the tricky one here but yeah basically I was taking a bucket at a spot on the creek okay. and, and timing it and figured yes. out, you know, okay, it's a roughly four liters per second. And then you do the math with the head yep. and then you can get an idea of what you're looking at in terms of watts. And I'm right at the bare minimum. And how close were you to what you calculated to where you arrived? Well, we're actually doing better than I, like it's, it, it's, it's over hundred Watts and um, it's, it's right in there. Yeah. So working with this fella, uh, Rob with off-grid engineering, shout out to Rob. He's, uh, He's really been helpful in dialing this in and um, just squeezing every single ounce of wattage out of this little turbine. Wow. And so, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're close to where we thought we'd be. He wasn't sure based on this low flow, low head scenario. It's right at the bottom end of his calculations, but it's been useful for him too to figure out how low can we take this. And so, yeah, 45 feet ahead at really low flow. We're still able to squeeze at the minimum 50 watts up to 200 watts in a high flow scenario. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Very cool. So that's my story. And uh, um, I hope I am, am able to just, um, I, you know, share any learnings and pass on 
you know, what's worked for me, what hasn't worked for me. And, uh, and yeah, it's, if I had any advice for anyone else trying to do this, it's, uh, just take, take your time. There's going to be challenges, but just have the faith that you're going to be able to figure it out. Maybe not that day, but maybe later that week. And it's just, and don't get discouraged when you're missing schedules and timelines. Cause that is discouraging. Like it's, I should be done this by now. And, uh, so that's, that's, yeah. It's a challenge, it's a marathon, but um, the reward is worth it. And I write myself some songs to remind me that I'll always be young and free in my mind this time. Oh. So hit me with another track, cause I'm coming back to feed this energy with love. Coming from the time when I heard the rhymes in the basement where I played sublime songs all the time. And I'm inclined to go inside that young. Innocent mind. I feel that moment one more time.